already done that. Awesome. Yeah. Calling together the meeting of the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Jack, would you please take the roll? Mayor Hodges. Here. Council President Johnson. Here. Council Member Quincy. Here. Hardcore President Tab. Here. Vice President Becker. Here. President Wheeler. Here. I, we, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would move our agenda. There's been a motion made. Is there a second? Second. A motion made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Oppose the same sign. All right. We have an agenda. We're starting with some new business. We will be having a time certain uh, public hearing on the budget at exactly five minutes after five. So we've got a generous eight minutes to conduct our, our business first. If we don't finish it all, we'll do it afterwards. So let's, uh, Jack, let's move forward. I would move um, item number one, which is the 2017 adopted capital program for the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board supported by general obligation bonds for Park Board Resolution 2017 R-245, requesting the issuance of $10,500,000 of bonds. B, Park Board Resolution 2017 R-239, requesting the issuance of $300,000 of assessment bonds for the 2017 disease tree removal program. And C, City Council Resolution 2017 R-400, requesting the issue issuance of $300,000 of assessment month bonds for the 2017 disease tree removal program. Uh, sorry. There's, is there right. a second? Second. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion of uh, those pieces with the park board that are before us for that uh, basically $11 million uh, in bonding? Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm looking at this, um, and perhaps um, Commissioner Tab can enlighten me. This resolution 2017-245 has the heading that's on our um, agenda, but then the whereas is uh, look like a lease agreement. I'm curious. Oh, I think this, you've got oh, the, I got the, got old the one? wrong one. That's okay. the old oh, one. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, right. so let me just say, Never if, you look, yeah, if okay. you look at the new one. Okay. All right. We'll that was one. just That's provided it. to us this afternoon. Okay. Uh, Ms. Becker. Um, I just have to say this is uh, the implementation of the 20-year park plan, and I am ecstatic to see that uh, we're going to make substantial improvements to our neighborhood parks. So thank you for everybody that worked on that, and it's exciting to see it actually happening. Thank you, and I would just like to say thanks to everybody who made this possible. We're very, very excited to... Um, start working on our many, many projects. We have a lot of incredibly busy staff who are working on these, um, and we look forward to being able to do a whole lot more than we've been able to do in the past. So, again, thanks to um, City Council, the Mayor, um, Council President Johnson for working with us on this. It's been a great, a great thing to make happen. You know, the thing that's remarkable, and I said this once before, <laughs> is that when we go to these national meetings with government finance officers associations and we talk about the fact that there's been a 20-year plan for our parks, which is, you know, the best park system in the country, and a 20-year plan for our streets, they say, 20 years? You know, they think one, two, three years down the line. This long-range thought, I think, was absolutely fabulous, and it says a lot about the leadership uh, in this in this city and, and, and the hard work that goes on. Uh, especially by staff to help make this a reality. So the, it's before us. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. That looks like we've got uh, all on board, Jack. Item two is uh, authorizing and award resolutions for the general obligation various purpose fall sale. <coughs> It'll happen basically um, in November. The uh, Finance and Property Service Department will be securing the ratings in late October. It will be $60 million. It supports the 2017 capital program and other projects previous capital years that have not had their cash outflows until recently. This requires five yay votes. I would move item number two. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? No discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Roll call. 
You need roll, do we need, we need a roll, roll call, call on this one? Okay. okay, excuse me. Thank you, Jack. Would you do a roll call for us? Mayor Hodges? Aye. Council President Johnson? Aye. Council Member Quincy? Aye. Park Board President Tab? Aye. Vice President Becker? Aye. President Wheeler? Aye. And that. Thank you very much. So now we've got our time certain and we've got, gosh, we, we did that in four minutes. We've got four extra minutes. Uh, would it, uh, we really can't start till 5.05 .05 would be my understanding. Is that correct? Can we, should, can we move to any other matters uh, to, for the next few minutes before we start our... Uh, Let's move to this. We move, yes. Uh, we killed several of those diseased trees and, and printed up some really good stuff, Jim. <laughs> Um, the top one basically um, is an illustration of various 2017 houses. The first house is 100,000 in market value, and the second house is 125, and it goes up. To the right of the shaded line, then, is if the question is asked, what happens if my estimated market value goes down 5%, goes down 2%, stays the same? Increases two and a half, increases five, increases seven and a half, ten percent, and twelve and a half percent. So you can run through these different scenarios, and you go to the bottom line uh, of each house. And so, if you had a hundred thousand dollar house and were paid seventeen, and it went down five percent in market value, your taxes would be eleven percent lower in eighteen, and that would be a fifty-one dollar uh, lower tax bill. So you can go through whatever scenario you think your house had, and it shows you what happens to the taxes. And that, that's the big one, the, the, the top four page or three page ones. Uh, Vice President Becker. Jack, how many houses are seeing a decrease of 5% in their estimated market um, value? When we get after the public hearing, um, I have information with regards to what I follow, which is, houses from 14 to 18 that are homesteaded in value and have not had any permits pulled. So all the value changes are based purely on market values. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of like to wait after the public hearing because we don't okay. have enough time to really discuss that. We'll, we'll take that up afterwards. Thank you, Jack. Any other <coughs> items for the next 90 seconds? <laughs> None that I can think. Do you sing? Do I sing? Yes, I do sing, but I don't think uh, I, I don't think that those who are gathered here or the public would appreciate hearing that. I'm trying to think of something else to kill. Oh, you you would like to hear me sing? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> Maybe not. There is to a dream the impossible. Okay, that's fine. That's enough. There is a sign-up sheet at the podium for. People wishing those yeah, pe people people who would like to to speak at our public hearing that's going to start in a minute. Uh, you may go sign up uh, if there are those of you who are listening <coughs> in the air right now that's and want to get down here in the near term future. You're very welcome to uh, to say say some words too. We're That'd delighted to have what? you here. They'd have to get here in one minute. Well, they can sign up uh, while somebody else is speaking. Mm -hmm. And and I uh, yes, but they're probably watching at home. Oh, yes. Well, yes. Probably uh, enjoying a, a meal and a beverage. Yes. So they can send in their comments and have them on the record. They can send in their comments. How, how, does, that, how does that work to send in their comments and have it on the record? <coughs> uh, you can go to the city's website and submit comments to the, I believe the city clerk would pass them to Mr. Qualley, or you can submit them to Mr. Qualley uh, for the record. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Chair. Thank you for that information, Mayor Hodges. All right. But that would mean that we would receive those after we set the maximum property tax levy. It does, but it would give them some input anyway. So. Well, it, it would be after the decision is made. After the decision is made, correct. Uh, on the other Mr. hand, Chair. we can pass that on to the council it, that will be uh, determining uh, it will either be spending after. the maximum levy or, le or less. It will be after the board has set the maximum but it'll be well in front of when the council adopts yes. in and December. Correct. Exactly. Yes, Mayor Hodges? Mr. Chair, I would also invite that, uh, since we are waiting, and the conversation was about whether somebody could get here in time to provide testimony to us during the hearing, 
and most people wouldn't be able to get here in time to provide testimony, but they could actually send an email in time for Mr. Quality to reflect that before we vote on the final tax levy. That is why I brought it up. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we have... Wait, Mr. Quality, are you online at the moment to receive emails? I'm not online right now. Can you can you get online, Jack, in case somebody sends you an email? He doesn't have his work computer. I'm not technologically competent enough to be online at the point. <laughs> My apologies, Mr. Yeah. Chair. The city clerk is able to receive and disseminate those emails during the meetings. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, but we have no way to receive them. Yes. I do think Just that very often when people come to testify, um, it's about issues that actually have a lot to do with the budget and, and the priorities within the budget. Uh, right. So, again, even getting testimony after the fact can be helpful because I think that can help the mayor and the city council determine, um, you know, how to s set some priorities or maybe change priorities as they go ahead and um, work through that the finalized budget. So, Very again, good. please, I think it's always helpful and relevant to send those in and those can be looked at and viewed by city council members and the mayor. Uh, Mr. Quincy, when, when is the, the final adoption of, of the budget? What's the data? Um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, adoption for the uh, budget, I believe, is December 6th. 6th. Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. That's the uh, date of the adoption of the budget. Um, there is a, a public hearing in uh, uh, two public hearings. One of those is on the sixth, uh, and in addition, and speaking about comments on the budget, which is not uh, what we're talking about here, is setting the maximum levy within the board of estimate taxation. Uh, but the uh, the tool that's been created for the website uh, is easily found at budget.minneapolismn.gov, and it invites comments uh, frequently during that process. The first of our department public hearings begins on October 3rd, and the schedule for those uh, department hearings are also available on that website. So people will be able to look at the actual budget, uh, the connection and the presentations associated with each of those department budgets, and uh, comments are welcome online uh, during that process. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Quincy. Uh, yes, Vice President Becker. Just to be clear, to the people who are watching at home, we have no way to get emails if you email us right now. And if you're getting this on uh, repeat on cable access, it is also too late because we will be making the vote for the maximum property tax levy in the next couple of minutes. Um, if you do want to have input into the budget process, though, you need to contact the city council and the mayor on that. It is too late to contact the Board of Estimate. Um, but please do participate. Um, God knows I've worked really hard to make sure that people have that opportunity. Please avail yourselves of it. Thank you very much. So now um, we're a little past our time certain, but uh, we have a public hearing that we never adjourned. So we are open for uh, a speaker. I know one <coughs> has joined us. Thank you very much for coming. And if you'd come up to the microphone and introduce yourself and let us know uh, your address, and we'd be delighted to hear, hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Paulson. I live on 4949 Upton Avenue South in the Fulton neighborhood. I've lived there with my family since October of 98. And I wanted to express my views about uh, the increase in the levy and what that means in terms of the proposed property taxes. And I don't know if this works. I have an exhibit that I'd like to share. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, you, it does work. All right, put it excellent. There. And so... Really what I wanted to say uh, in view of this uh, proposal for uh, the levy increase, which then backs up, of course, the property taxes, it's that it's excessive and exploitive and totally insensitive to the burden that it's putting on households in my neighborhood and the city in totality. And what I mean by that is if you look at this exhibit, and I don't know how to... Yeah, it looks... I can uh, <laughs> This, uh, what this shows is the overall property taxes in the city of Minneapolis from 02 to 017, which have increased at 5.3% per year. My bill for my house has increased 5.5% per year. 
Theoretically, in 2002, if my income was 100 and 100,000 per year and it increased at this average rate of average weekly earnings in the state of Minnesota over the <coughs> period of time, that's a 1.9%. So the share of my income that's gone to property taxes from 2002 to 17 has nearly doubled. Uh, and if it had not doubled, if the share had remained consistent over that period of time, I would be paying uh, $2,000. $493 less per year. And what this is such a, you know, there's not a lot of evidence for what this results in, in terms of burden within my neighborhood. Anecdotally, there's been dozens of people that I've known over the years who have either chosen not to move in my neighborhood and move to St. Louis Park or Edina because of that burden, or because when they had children, they moved because the tax burden was too high relative to the value that you get uh, for schooling and housing in Minneapolis. So I think that this continued increase in the levy is exacerbating the distortions between Minneapolis or those Southwest neighborhoods and the, those adjoining suburbs, Edina and St. Louis Park, and it produces more flight. And what's even more scarier to me is if I look at your five-year forecast, that's for a 5.5% increase each year. And so for the city, to me, it's as our representatives, it's very important that you not only acknowledge the burden that you're putting on the, on the households of Minneapolis, but you're exacerbating what I call rent shifting from the people who use the assets of Minneapolis, which is Minneapolis and all the surrounding community. So you're putting more rents on us, the homeowners in Minneapolis, and you're not taxing or you're shifting the rents from the people in the suburban communities. So there should be a different mechanism for the city to pay for its bills. The city should take a more, I think, responsive recognition of the burden that they're putting on to the households <laughs> of the city by trying to provide more services for about the same cost, like every large business does in the United States. And as I said earlier, looking for a different mechanism to lower the burden, to create more equality between Minneapolis and the suburban communities. And you could do that by putting on a use fee for the city of Minneapolis. So if, you don't, if you're not a resident of Minneapolis, what would you say if we were to put a $200 fee for you to park in the city of Minneapolis if you're not a resident, like the, state, the city of Tucson, like Deep Haven in our own community, or like Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is, they charge 270 per year. If we look at what the city has, if you were to lower the property tax burden could, for Could the you city move it down Minneapolis, a little bit? We're missing yeah. some, of the, some of the piece on this. Just move it a little yes. farther down. Right there. Yeah, thank you, yeah. thank okay. you, appreciate that. So if you were to reduce the city's burden on taxpayers by 20%, that would create a revenue hole in the city of Minneapolis budget of 31.4 million. If you charge the use fee for parking in the city, if you were not a resident of $200, you would have to have 157,000 users. If you look at how many people commute here per day in a car from outside, uh, you would be able to tax 53,000 of those and you'd have to find 83,000 for people who don't commute and park in the city. Now, obviously these are just rough numbers and you can uh, manipulate them that would also uh, no doubt result in lower congestion as people chose to take the bus or to carpool with a friend versus paying the 200 bucks. But there's different mechanisms that create different public policy goals uh, um, or to help meet different public policy goals while reducing the burden on the Minneapolis taxpayer. So that's really what I wanted to testify. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for coming before us and uh, clearly thinking through uh, some other alternatives. Um, any response, discussion, uh, reactions, friends? It's a public hearing. It's for the public to give us input. We need to close the public hearing, have a discussion. Okay. Uh, let us close the public hearing. If somebody shows up, are we willing to reopen the hearing if somebody shows up in the next few minutes? No. So Definitely. seeing that, we're going to, we, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. 
moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. We are closed. Now we're open for discussion. Yes. Um, so my question, I think, is for you or for Mr. Qualley, uh, just what is the process now? I mean, I have some comments I'd like to make, both about the budget and the process, but I want to make sure I'm doing it at, at, at the appropriate I think, time. Yeah, I think you need to move item four. Okay. So we will move to item four and then uh, have an and then We'll walk through that, and then it'll be item five will be the consideration of the levy. All right. Um, which we will then probably want to make comments for. All right. We had already moved the, the, the whole agenda earlier, so let's move to uh, four. Updated information to propose maximum tax levies for 2018. The first multi-page thing is what we went over before the public hearing. So you can look up a housing value and ask yourself the theoretical question of what happened to the market value of what happened to the taxes. Um, as I've always said, there may be a, a simple question about property taxes, but I don't care how simple the question is. There are no, no simple answers. Um, in 2002 to 2017 is an extended period of time, which is complicated for the analysis because the market value of credit that was not in existence back in 2002 was a homestead credit and had a different effect basically on different homes. The next page basically at the top shows the estimated market values for pay 2018 and this has almost 51,000 homes in it that from 2014 to 2018 have not had any permits pulled. So all these value changes are based on pure marketplace. And <clears throat> this is the breakdown of homes by bracket. So if you go down to bracket number nine, which is $250,000 estimated market value to 275,000, you can see there's 3,759 parcels for 7.4% of the sample size in, in that bracket. So it gives you the distribution of housing within these different brackets of home values. The page, the section below. Jack, Jack I, I need to jump in at this moment because I'm, this is, people who are watching this have no clue of what we're talking about because this is a huge, complicated, and complex document. What the public is interested in who are listening to us and this whole thing, what they're interested in is what is going to be the effect on my house. And it varies all over the city. It, it, the taxes, I used to live in Linden Hills. I live very close to it now. Taxes in Linden Hills are about the highest of anywhere in the city. There's a few other places that might be a little bit higher, but they're high. I know. I lived on Abbott. Um, and it's very different uh, in parts of the north side. It's very different uh, in other neighborhoods. <coughs> And it's very tough to understand with it. This is a great document, but it, it the public isn't going to going to understand from our discussion unless we make it really straightforward what we're talking about right now. Unfortunately, that's what the TNT process is about. And those parcel specific information is mailed out by the county in the middle of November. And that's what provides each individual homeowner with their impact not only for the city, but for the county and the school district and the miscellaneous taxing districts. And that's the information that, under the process, goes out, in which the city pays a proportionate postage fee for, um, to all the individual property owners in the middle of November. And that's what generates the public attendance at the council's public hearing in December before the adoption. Before that, there is basically no public information disseminated on a parcel specific basis. Um, is, are these documents or are these things available to the public? They'll be posted on the board's website, but 
unless an individual property owner knows what their actual market value is for pay 18, uh, and these are brackets, you know, they're not going to know what their taxes are. And this is only the city portion, not not the, not correct. the other. That's correct. This, this five is, percent or whatever. This is the city's tax bill, the city, not the com total tax bill. Uh, Vice President Becker. Jack, I skipped to the last page, um, and and tell me if I'm reading the last page at the top of the form correctly. Um, does this say that about 14.5% of homeowners will have a decrease in taxes, and about 30% will see an increase of 10% or more under the mayor's proposed budget? <clears throat> The last page on the top, you're correct. This shows that basically 14.4% of the parcels will have a tax decrease. That's 7,000 plus parcels. 85%, percent will have a tax increase depending upon the valuations. And it breaks out the different brackets. So like um, the 5%, the 7.5%, 14.7% of the parcels in that category and that. So it gives you an overall breakout of the parcels within this 51,000, but it doesn't tell you specifically on an individual address, you know, where they are and that. And the table down below basically compares the annualized percentage change um, from pay eight 18 compared to pay 2014 and that. So, um, which is a four year time span. Uh, go ahead, uh, Vice President Becker. I'm also doing a little bit of quick math. About 15% of homeowners are going to, sorry, 10% of homeowners are going to see a 15% or more increase under this budget. So that's the, the top, the bottom three on that list. Um, it's possible it would be possible to post this top page, top part of this all, last page? All, all these extended pages will be posted on the, on the board's website next week. Next week they'll be there? Right. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Further discussion? About item four here. About item four. Anything else on item four? There's nothing on that that we need to vote on. It was just a presentation. So let's move to item five. Consideration of setting the maximum tax levies payable in 2018 with regards to the charter and truth and taxation compliance. The draft resolutions are correspond to the mayor's recommended levy level, levy proposals. I will move that. I would second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, is there a discussion? Yes, Mayor Hodges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, there's a couple things that I would like to say. First, about the budget itself. Uh, that the budget that I have presented to the City Council um, and the considerate and the tax levy that has been brought forward to the Board of Estimate and Taxation builds on investments of the last three years and the challenges and the opportunities that the city are face is fa has been facing. It also builds on the last decade plus of fiscal responsibility that we've brought to the city. It's a structurally balanced budget. Uh, it incorporates the parks and streets uh, funding that we agreed on as, as me as the mayor and the city council and the parks. Uh, it stabilizes, uh, brings some stability to the general fund through the creation of the downtown assets fund. Um, it incorporates the request of the uh, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board for the fourth straight year. I have just incorporated that request at their request. Um, and it follows the levy uh, as proposed in the five-year financial direction that the council did vote on and support last year. Um, and so the levy is the one, again, that was proposed last year. Um, this budget also incorporates $2.6 million worth of cuts. Um, and this levy and this maximum levy uh, does build the base upon which the rest of the Parks and Streets plan is built um, for the next 
18, 19 years. And so it's important uh, that we get the maximum levy here today so that we can keep with the plan that we have for the Parks and Streets Investment Plan. Uh, and the only question before us today is the maximum levy um, as the BET. Now, and I ask everybody, and I ask people to support uh, what, is, what is before us and what I put forward. Uh, but I also know that there's been a lot of conversation about the timing of my budget presentation and the impact that that had on the Board of Investment and Taxation. And um, the court ruled in my favor. The court went through each of the charter's five requirements for a budget and found clearly that I had met each one in my August 15th budget message. I'm under no illusions about how Ms. Becker feels about me, but that is not material. The court ruled against the complaint. And as confirmed by the judge's ruling, mayors in Minneapolis have the authority under the charter to provide the required budget information by August 15th, but doing so does not prevent mayors from augmenting that with final detailed appropriations at a later date. And this is not a new flexibility. It has existed in the charter and has been the basis for recommendations by the city attorney office to at least the last three mayors. Nobody should pretend to be surprised by this because that authority does not just exist on paper. All three of the recent mayors, Mayor Sells Belton, Mayor Ryback, and I have exercised that authority. And mayors have always had this flexibility. And here's a piece of information. It has, this authority has been used 11 times in the last 24 years. I will repeat that. 11 of the last 24 full detailed budgets have been presented after August 15th and this authority that we have been using. The difference between my use of this flexibility and all but one of the 10 other times it's been used is that I have left the BET more than two weeks to consider the implications of my full budget on the maximum levy and the public more than two weeks. And the good news is it worked. Um, in 2014 and 2015 and 2016, when we went back through the records, precisely zero people showed up to testify at the Board of Estimate and Taxation about the, about the proposed maximum tax levy. This year, we've had two folks come. So I used this flexibility when I needed it because I wanted to present the best budget that I could to this board, to the council, and to our residents. And I used it because I want, and we all want, Chief Arredondo to succeed. And a key part of helping him succeed was giving him the opportunity to put his stamp on his department's budget, which he has now done in the budget that I have presented. And so that, um, you know, that timing uh, led to the budget that was in front of us, the consideration uh, that is in front of us for the maximum tax levy, and I renew my request for the approval of the maximum tax levy today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Hodges. I have a feeling there might be somebody that may want to say something. Barb? Uh, uh, Council President Johnson. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I have a question for Mr. Ruff. <clears throat> so um, when we look at the budget, I think it's helpful, and we had our budget overview last uh, week. What's the one-time spending that is uh, uh, in this budget? $11 million, something like that? President, uh, Council President Johnson, I'm Mark Ruff, the city's chief financial officer. Uh, there is approximately $11 million in one-time spending. That I think that's the gross number that includes the Super Bowl reimbursement, if I am correct. Oh, okay, so that's Mills. maybe right. 10 so, million then. Right, so the, so the number is closer to $8 million when we net out okay. the Super Bowl okay. those committee reimbursements. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, I guess uh, with a follow-up question then, Mr. Ruff, um, could um, some of that $8 million uh, have been used uh, to uh, accommodate the uh, increased spending uh, on the park board, uh, park and streets um, um, commitment rather than the levy? Mr. President, Council President Johnson, I, I think as a policy, the council has if we assume that the park board contributions are ongoing contributions, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. as policy, the council has chosen not to use one-time money for ongoing spending, mm -hmm. I think typically. Mm -hmm. um, is that option in front of you? Yes, but it would change, I think, the commitment then and the understanding in the ordinance. So mm -hmm. there's also, um, so I think it would be more about matching ongoing money with the ongoing obligations that are within mm -hmm. the park constraints. 
I just, I mean, I remember when we uh, did the the agreement um, that there would be a year by year, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, year by year look at you know how we would pay for this commitment, and there's different options, you know, and including library debt and as that goes away and that that kind of thing. But I, I, I mean, it, it would be the case that. Uh, we could, instead of increasing the levy to account for the increased park board spending, we could choose to use one time. It would just put us. I, I, what would it do to us going forward then, if that was if if we chose to do that? Sure, Mr. President, Council President Johnson. I think it would then require us to reprioritize how we use one-time money and just hope that that one-time money continues to reappear mm -hmm. every year, and mm -hmm. that's the mm -hmm. that's the answer. We're not building it into the base, right? Then. Yeah, right. Okay. And just okay. clarification, I found the page. Um, so the exact number is uh, eleven point nine million in one-time spending, of which three point four for general fund is is um, super bowl so reimbursement. Nine, nine, so it's eight point five million dollars okay. of one time, and then five point one of ongoing for the okay. change items okay. as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mr. You. President, as, as long as I'm as long no. as I'm here, can I just Certainly. add a couple of other things? And I think it's related to the testimony too. Is it'd be fine. I, I would just like to remind the council. I'm sorry, the board, as was brought up in the <coughs> presentation that I made at the previous meeting, that um, a, a function of property tax increases is not just related to city spending, but also the state aids that we received. And if you recall the chart that I presented in 2002, which is a, a, the same year as as the Gentleman mentioned, and then I mentioned, um, we had 41% of our general fund come from state aids, and this year it is 15%. Um, yeah. And so, the state clearly hasn't kept up with inflation on how much they write down property taxes. And so, I would just remind the audience that certainly, um, not to take away from the testimony, because clearly costs are going up, and people have to pay more for those costs, and and many of us don't like to do that. But at the same time, there is some blame that needs to be shared with our our friends at the state in terms of those LGA levels. And the, the second comment that, that I think I've made at every public meeting I've been at, which is we know as a staff and we all know personally people who have burdens in paying property taxes. It's not just about the increase, but it's the raw number that people have to pay. And just a reminder that the state of Minnesota does have a rebate program. Um, it is both for renters and homeowners. It's I think called renters credit and 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 homeowners um, circuit breaker. But if you go either to any place where you pick up tax forms, it is a Minnesota Department of Revenue tax form M1 PR, and you can go online and do your search engine for for property tax rebates in Demar Minnesota Department of Revenue. And it is not just a small amount of money; it can be hundreds of dollars of reimbursement of property taxes, and the state is aware that that um, especially for people on fixed income property tax increases are a burden and there is it's not going to help you make this year's payment but it, there will be a, a rebate that is um is real and i think many of us know those folks who have received those so just a, a comment that that we're, we're certainly sensitive to those burdens that property taxes place on homeowners thank you mr ruff uh, uh ms thank tam you. had had her hand up uh, park board president yeah. right um I think um, many of the much of the park board funding is going to come through bonding, so I don't know how much of an effect that you we actually see in the in the annual operating budget. Um, and I think that the park board's requested increase this year was it four point one percent, Julie? Four point one in total. <coughs> so. I, we're we're Inclu actually including the increase for the, including the increase for the twenty year program. Yes, because the twenty year we did last year, so there's n there's not significant. Go ahead, thank you. You can explain it. <laughs> <clears throat> um, the property tax increase includes the three million dollars that's part of the NPP twenty for the maintenance. So that um, included that's included in the property tax increase. The bonding is separate. That is not a part of our property tax levy. And we did have a significant increase last year that's already built into the base when we did do the increase for, <clears throat> excuse me, the maintenance. And that, uh, we did that was sort of as a one-time um, line item. So moving forward, we are sort of back to <clears throat> a normal 
amount. And, and frankly, a lot of the increase, um, you know, has to do with, with costs like minimum wage increases, um, health insurance, that that continue, I think, to plague mm -hmm. all of us, you know, all of our organizations in ways that we never would have suspected 20 years ago. And, and it, it is, it's a real challenge to, to deal with those kinds of increase in costs. I do think um, in the last even eight years, um, the increases that I have seen come through have generally been considerably lower than I did prior to that. Um, and I think we've um, tried to keep those down. But property taxes are incredibly difficult to predict because as I think Mr. Ruff so aptly pointed out, we used to get substantial aid from the state that went away. The balance of how property taxes are levied on businesses versus residential have shifted from business to residential. So there are a lot of um, unfortunate circumstances um, that have caused the property taxes to increase. I think one of the things that we want to make sure that as a city we do is have um, continue to have growth in our city and that helps us to spread the burden among more people and hopefully we'll keep our property taxes down over the longer term. But it, it is, it's a, it's a very complicated issue, much more complicated than I had ever thought when I started getting into it. It gave me headaches. So. Um. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Park President Tam. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, I, I didn't see her there. Apologize. Go ahead, Council President Johnson. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I appreciate Mr. Ruff given the real number of, of what our local government aid was, but I, I've been on council 20 years. When I first came on the council, we received more of our general fund budget from state aids than we actually levied in property tax. I mean, it was an amazing, there's been an amazing turnabout. And your point about the move from commercial industrial to residential exacerbated that problem. And we did have many years where we had to have an 8% property tax increase. That was our policy. Um, Councilmember Hodges, or excuse me, Mayor Hodges in the mid 2000s, mid 2000s. Yeah. And that, that was, then we would have, uh, when we were doing that, we would have a full house. Uh, let's uh, oh, yeah. say that. Um, and that was really onerous on people. But I do appreciate um, the gentleman's point about uh, the surrounding communities, because that is absolutely true. And people make decisions about, you know, what, what's, what's it worth to live in the city uh, when you could have a property that was equally valued uh, in one of the adjoining suburbs and pay substantially less property taxes. So people make decisions about that, and I think we have to be cognizant of that, cognizant of that all the time. Um, I represent a corner of the city, and so I'm bordered by Brooklyn Center and Robbinsdale, and people make that comparison all the time, although the, those two suburbs are kind of close to us. Um, but I think it's more uh, challenging out in Southwest, on, in the Southwest suburbs, or Southwest part of Minneapolis and those adjoining suburbs. So it's a real challenge, it's a real challenge. But we have increasing costs every year, as uh, uh, Commissioner Tapp pointed out. Um, uh, our uh, employee costs go up, uh, uh, healthcare costs go up, uh, uh, everything we buy costs more uh, every year. and. Uh, uh, it's it is a challenge. It is a challenge, um, but I I think we've been responsible. I will say. Uh, just a, a quick word. I I know the uh, the gentleman who testified to us, which we really appreciate, had a question, and I I I'm willing, and I'm sure other people are willing to stay afterwards and 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 entertain those conversations with you. Thank you for your hanging in there with us, uh, Mr. Ruff. Did you have uh, something something more you'd like to say? Mr. President, I, I think I don't think I fully answered the council president's question because I, I think I was thinking more operating costs rather than capital costs. And so when the council president was asking if we reduced, um, I think debt, the bond amount that we were to issue with one-time costs. In other words, if we cash, pay cash, right, pay cash instead of issuing mm -hmm. debt, what would that do to save us in mm -hmm. the terms of property taxes mm -hmm. next year? And mm -hmm. within the parks and streets, we set up the capital debt service over a 10 year period. And mm -hmm. so we have to think about the fact that then we would, at least for next year, not have a 
debt service payment associated with that, and that's mm -hmm. just under a million dollars. Oh. So the mm -hmm. property tax increase in that particular situation then could go down by essentially one third of 1%. One so it could go from 5.5% down to 5.2% uh -huh. if you were to make a choice of paying pay cash, cash instead of issuing debt. Great. So now that I fully understand the question, just very want to make helpful. sure I fully answered the question. Very well. helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Becker. Um, I wanted to clarify some of the comments that um, the mayor made. Um, one comment the mayor made was that she had delayed releasing the budget. Um, the argument that the mayor made was that the seven tables that were scattered within the eight pages speech that she gave constituted mm -hmm. the full mm -hmm. budget. Yeah. And the argument that she made before the judge was that, in fact, that met all the legal requirements and she is under no compunction to produce anything less, else. So if you were concerned about how much we were spending on affordable housing or on streets or on bike lanes, um, the mayor, under this understanding of the budget process, is never under the requirement to provide any more information. Um, and that's what was argued before the courts. Um, I find that substantially a bad process. Um, and the judge did too. And I wanted to read what uh, Judge Mary Vasily wrote um, because I took the mayor to court on this issue about providing a budget that is an inch thick and not seven skimpy tables. And the judge wrote- I, Excuse me for just a second. I, I'm not so sure that this process is particularly helpful to setting the property tax levy, which is the piece that is before us right now. And I understand there's some animus around this issue, but I, it feels to me like it's time to sort of move beyond the past and to work on setting the property tax levy. Um, it's a personal comment, but I, that's, that's how I'm feeling at present. So Judge Mary, Mary Vasily said, nonetheless, the court agrees with Ms. Becker that a recommended budget that does more than meet the bare minimum requirements of the charter would be a much more useful document. The recommended budget provided on August 15th serves as a foundation for further budget discussions and negotiations. By providing a recommended budget, the mayor has the privilege and duty of leading the city by setting financial priorities that support her considered objectives. The Board of Estimate, City Council, and taxpayers should be given the full advantage of her leadership, as well as a meaningful opportunity for input. Providing the minimum information required on August 15th and later Supplementing it is not a process that allows city officials and the public a full opportunity to contribute their expertise and raise their concerns about the recommended budget. Such a procedure compresses the time available to those like Ms. Becker who need to study pertinent information before they take the next step in the process. It also disadvantages those in the public who would add value to the process by contributing to a full discussion of all aspects of the budget, including the details. The result is to diminish the quality of the ultimate product and a comprehensive city budget, which is, of course, vitally important to the city. As Ms. Becker says, a budget is the most critical policy statement that any governmental organization makes. The more detailed and thoughtful the budget recommended on August 15th, the more likely it is the budgeting process will produce a budget that works well for the city. I support what the judge said. Um, I believe that we deserve better than the process that we've had. Um, and we deserve better than a, a precedent that says all we need are seven little tables. Um, thank you for the two folks that did come. Um, and I believe we would have had more people if we had had more robust information. Um, having had some time to review the budget, um, it looks to me like it's a Christmas list for just about every special interest group. Um, we're looking at 15% uh, of our homeowners seeing a 10% or more increase I'm sorry, 30% of our homeowners seeing a 10% or more increase, 10% of our homeowners seeing a 15% or more increase, plus franchise fees increases, plus utility fee increases, at a time when our city is booming, our economy is growing, our population is growing, and we are making the city unaffordable to live in. Um, this is way above inflation. This is way above um, our wage increases. I have had the same wage increase experience as you, sir. Um, and I get it. Um, I will not be voting uh, yes on this. Um, I don't think that this has been a good process for democracy. I think that these tax increases make it increasingly hard for people to live in the city. I think we deserve better. Um, 
I would also um, say to the mayor, this is not personal. This is about what the process should be. This is about a strong democracy. And it's about doing what's right. I have no personal animosity to you. I know that your staff have attacked me. I've read what you've written about me. They have not written anything like that back about you. But I do think that this is not serving our city well. And I look forward to working with people in our community to make a better process. Thank you. Sort of feeling like I need a referee uh, outfit on uh, here. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Mayor Hodges indicated she would like to respond, and so I will give the and and, and you had a you had a comment. I, yes, I have a okay. comment. I just want to make sure everyone realizes that we are setting a maximum property tax increase. Um, that's what the board does. I have in fact seen the city council. Um, after having passed a maximum increase, actually lower it. So there, so as the, the city goes through the process of looking at um, what the budget looks like and trying to agree amongst all of them, there, there is always the opportunity to do that. Again, I know that when, when we did our budget um, and we looked at sort of what we were doing today and just sort of keeping everything level, we were sort of like in the hole by about $2 million. I can't remember the exact number, Julie, but just, just to stay even with what you're doing um, very often is incredibly expensive. So unless you begin to lower some of the service levels, um, we are, I know from a park board perspective, we're looking at an increase. Um, and, and that's sort of just to sort of keep things level. So um, I can imagine the city probably faces those same kinds of things. But again, the city does have a very robust process and goes through a lot of the, the details where they begin to, to work out specifics of the budget. And, and again, I have seen them come in lower than, than what was proposed. Okay. Mayor Hodges. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And first on the maximum levy, I appreciate Commissioner Tabb's comments on uh, President Tabb's comments on uh, the role that the BET is playing here to vote on a maximum property tax levy, not the budget as a whole, um, and also on the, uh, you know, the cost of current service level and inflation, um, which are covered here in the proposed maximum tax levy along with the costs of our parks and streets agreement as we agreed to um, uh, as a city and as parks last year. Um, regarding the budget, the court essentially said that it would be better for a mayor to present a full budget on August 15th. And I agree, of course, which is why I did so my first three years, as Ms. Becker pointed out in court, and why I presented my full budget two weeks ago with months <coughs> remaining for consideration by the city council and the public. It would also have been better if we had not had two major public safety crises over a period of three weeks during the time that I typically make final budget decisions. So I applied common sense and used the flexibility at my disposal to meet both the requirements of the charter and the urgent needs of our residents. Uh, Council Member Quincy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just uh, wanted to speak in favor of the motion to adopt the um, uh, resolution on setting the maximum levy at 5.5%. I do so. Uh, with the understanding that was consistent with the uh, financial projections uh, that we voted on in the last budget. Because one of the advantages of having a priority-based budget uh, with a five-year uh, projection as possible uh, makes that uh, a real thing that we've already taken a vote on. And I'm pleased to see that this budget stays in line with the uh, anticipated um, levy increases that would, require to, would be required for ongoing expenses uh, at a at, you know, the levy would cover those ongoing expenditures um, as, as it would continue to do that and not make use of one-time funds uh, recognizing that one-time funds can only be used how many times once so this is a combination of uh, park board levy it's a combination of the of the park board levy as well as the uh, city operations uh, net debt bond levy what we're doing with the municipal building commission um, various retirement funds. These are all uh, well, uh, well constructed, structurally balanced budgets, and I believe that the, this levy um, 
accommodates uh, those requirements as, as, uh, as effectively as possible. And I'd also like to point out when we were talking about in the not too distant past, uh, when we were looking at 8.8 .8 levy uh, adoptions, the feels like factor was much more significant to the individual resident, especially in my neighborhoods in South Minneapolis, we were experiencing a, a feels like experience of uh, double digits in terms of up closer to 20%. And that's the, what we're seeing now is that, that uh, with the growth, growth in population and with the gr growth of uh, new pro taxable properties, as a develop, as for example, we've had six consecutive years of over a billion dollars of permits pulled. That's adding to our tax base. That's sharing the burden much more widely, much more evenly, and uh, makes it a uh, feels like factor that is much more tolerable. Uh, it's no fun to pay taxes. Nobody wishes to do that. And I'm anxious to talk to uh, fellow council members as we take up the budget to see if we can make changes within the structurally balanced budget to accommodate that. But I believe uh, firmly that the uh, uh, financial projections that called for a 5.5% levy increase in the out years, um, uh, and it's consistent with this year's budget, recommended budget, I'm, uh, I'm uh, going to be supporting the uh, levy uh, adoption uh, as the, mo the motion that's in front of us. Okay. Um, I will have the last, well, maybe, no, I will have the last word eventually, but uh, Ms. Becker and then Jack. I just wanted to clar clarify a couple points. Um, when we talk about current service level, um, I went and looked back, we were, the budget that's as proposed increases uh, the FTE, that's the number of people working for the city, uh, to its highest level since at least 2001. I didn't go earlier than that. Um, so this is not a current service level. This is an expansion budget. We are seeing these tax increases at a time where, as, as uh, Council Member Quincy noted, the tax base is growing in addition to these tax increases. That should be bringing our taxes down not seeing huge tax increases. Um, I do support what Commissioner Tabb said, um, and I really look forward and I hope that the city council will scrub this budget down and bring it down to um, a reasonable level um, because these increases are too high. Thank you. Uh, council President uh, Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Rupp, can you help me again if we paid cash uh, for the park board bonds um, how much could we reduce the levy? 5.5 .5 down to what? 5.3? Is that what you said? Mr. President, uh, Council President Johnson, I, I think I said that uh, the debt service levy that's associated with next year's budget would go down by just under a million dollars. And if we consider that, and I was rounding, so yep. if you want me to do more no, no. specific calculations, yep. but the rounding was to say that um, you know, something just over $3 million of levy increase is a 1%. 1%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 1 million being about a third of that <coughs> means mm -hmm. it's about a 0.3% increase. So that mm -hmm. was the rounding number from 5.5 .5 down to 5.2. 5.2. Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Uh, I'm going to move a substitute motion that we set the maximum tax levy at 5.2% uh, um, for 2018 taxes. Table and uh, so next motion one has been moved. Is there a second? Uh, I will second for purposes of discussion. For purposes of discussion, there is a second. Jack, what were you going to say? Well, uh, with regards to the motion, you have the couch tablet table uh, labeled number five in your packet. The board sets the levies by individual funds. So if you want to reduce the maximum, you need to reduce an individual fund levy. So the debt service levy? What you? The other thing I wanted to point out was the mayor's proposed budget. The tax capacity rate decreases 4.2%. So that's a tax capacity rate decrease of 4.2%. What that means is if your home is under $500,000, you have to have a value increase in excess of 2.5% to even see any increase in your taxes. Now, as we know, most homeowners 
their home is their best asset they have, the most important asset, the most valuable asset. Yet, it's so in a way it's somewhat counterintuitive if you see your asset increasing that you're not, you know, paying the price to see that increase. I mean, but that's the way taxes work. I mean, we have a motion before us, and it's been seconded for so we can have discussion. Uh, somebody would like to speak to that? Yes. Um, would the would the intent then be to use one-time funds to lower the levy? The levy? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I, I, I was clear about that. Uh, Mr. President? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I um, was. Uh, I know that it's, it's awfully <coughs> difficult to do on uh, uh, in the back of your napkin there, Mr. Ruff, but I was wondering, uh, as we're considering a uh, the idea of lowering the levy amount this year, I understand that the implications in out years would be to create to fill that hole. I was wondering if you could estimate what the uh, financial projections would be in the out years uh, if we were to adopt uh, the uh, was it 5.2 5.3 that uh, was made in the substitute motion by the council president. Um, Mr. President, uh, Council Member Quincy, uh, there would be an impact. Uh, Estimating that would be difficult, um, but as we have described before, the Parks and Streets agreement is not just a one-time agreement of an increase. There is an assumption that there will be a, approximately a 0.6 to 0.7 percent increase in the levy every year to accommodate the additional capital spending. Um, and that was a longer than 10-year assumption. So, you know, I, number one, I was, my assumption was, is that the question raised by the council president was that this is not um, taking funds from a, from a fund balance, for example, our general fund balance, but was a replacement of, for example, the one-time spending. So I just want to caution that if it were, if it were to take money from fund balances and still have the same level of one-time spending, then that would be an additional burden upon the city. So I don't mean to be evasive. It's a question that's being raised, um, and I just don't feel comfortable doing <coughs> the math on my feet other than to say there will be an impact, but is it a future 1% you know, increase versus 0.1% increase in the levy? I just can't answer that scale at, at this time. Certainly would be happy to follow up with the council at the appropriate time, but there will be some some impact. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'm going to speak against uh, this motion um, that the substitute, um, because this would, in effect, create a structurally imbalanced, either do one of two things, create a structurally imbalanced budget that is not sustainable over the long haul, that would, or it would eliminate one-time funding for some key departmental priorities, including spending in the clerk's office, including spending in the police department, uh, fire department equipment, all kinds of things would be jeopardized if we use the, all the one-time funding for this, uh, or else it would create a structurally imbalanced budget. Um, and either way, it would create um, significantly higher pressure on the property tax levy in out years because of the way we structured this plan for parks and streets. Uh, because of the way we've structured it, it would, because the base of our levy wouldn't be as high this year, we would actually have to have higher property tax levies in out years to account for our portion of the of the parks and streets agreement. And so not only is this creating either a hardship for our departments or a structurally imbalanced budget, um, uh, it would also create significant pressures on the property tax <coughs> levy in future years when and we don't know how, how our growth is going to go in future years, but we know that the growth is uh, is strong now and that an increase now is actually as Councilmember Quincy pointed out spread across more properties and higher property tax values. I would also note that if Council President Johnson did want to make changes, she has the authority through the Council to work to make those changes uh, in December 
giving weeks and actually at this point months um, to vet through some of the proposed changes that she wanted to make and the long-term impact and the structural impact on the budget. Um, so I'd say I, I just speak against this motion tonight. It's a precipitous action that could have devastating consequences on our services, our departments, uh, the structural balance of our budget and our future property taxes. <coughs> Uh, gosh, I thought I was going to get to say the last word about 10 minutes ago, but I guess not. So, we Council Member uh, Tab, President Tab, go thank ahead. Thank you. Um, my honest preference would be for us to pass the 5.5 and let City Council really work <clears throat> through scrubbing the budget um, themselves. I know that makes it very difficult and it puts a lot of pressure on Council. But I do always um, have some concern about making changes once some assumptions have been made um, up here sort of at the last minute because I don't, uh, because I, would, I know that the council hasn't had a chance to go through sort of in a lot of detail um, what's going on uh, with the budget. So again, I would love to see us come in at something less than 5.5, but I would, I, I really would like for the, I, I personally, my preference is, is that, that we pass the 5.5 and again, give the council um, some marching orders to really look hard at that. Is there further discussion on the, on the motion that is before us, the substitute motion? There is no further uh, discussion. Then Jack, would you roll call vote, please? Pardon? If you vote no, thank you, yes. If you vote no, it's no for the substitute. If you vote yes, it's in favor of the substitute. Mayor Hodges. No. Council President Johnson. Aye. Council Member Quincy. No. Park Board President Tab. No. Vice President Becker. No. President Wheeler. No. That motion, the substitute motion fails. So the motion before us now is for the 5.5% property tax levy. Um, has everybody had the opportunity to speak to this? Um, Ms. Becker? Um, Council President Johnson, I appreciate your motion. And despite the fact that I voted against it, I appreciate where you're going. Thank you. Very good. Any further discussion? Well, at long last, I'll say a few words. Uh, Churchill said, be brief, be witty, and be seated. I'm already seated, so I'll see if I can do one or two of the others. Um, first of all, I think that by setting the maximum property tax levy at what has been requested, what has been part of the long-range plan, uh, is sensible and prudent. It is more than I'm comfortable with. On the other hand, it will give the public and the elected officials who make the final decisions on it the opportunity to, to um, I heard the word scrub, but you know, to, to, to take a close look at it and do what needs to happen to, to make, it, uh, make it better. I think as I have read and understood the budget, and I can't claim to do it as well as, as every person who has been working on it, I think it is a prudent and progressive budget. It sets some very good priorities for our city. Uh, I am uh, continue to be absolutely uh, amazed and delighted at the quality of the staff who worked on this and who, who diligently put in lots of hours and listen well and respond to requests and have crafted, I think, a, a pretty good budget. And you're gonna be busy in the next few months doing the rest of the stuff, as will the elected officials who sit here in the city council. Um, I'm pleased that our city is growing economically. I think uh, we need to help have others pay for the cost of the city of Minneapolis. I have long felt that we're, we are the economic engine of the state of Minnesota. We pay far more in taxes and support our state than we get back in support. And everybody from the, from the surrounding area comes in and makes use of all the amenities that we as the taxpayers pay for. And, and uh, I, I think at some point there may be some opportunities to, uh, to redress that. And I do think that the state needs to step up and say, yes, 
uh, we're grateful for what you've done, and they need to increase their local government aid. I mean, I just, I, there's just no question about that. Anyway, long and short, uh, I'm in favor of the 5.5. I want to see <coughs> that it can be um, made less, and, and the process will, will, will improve that. But I, I will be voting in favor of the levy increase. Uh, and uh, Jack, uh, just a second. Um, it's time to move to a vote. And and uh, I, w I think we need to do that as a staff person. Is there, uh, th does anybody have a question of Jack that he could respond to us on? I think it's important to realize the mayor's proposed budget meets the legal requirements for the bond redemption fund under state statute. Okay. <coughs> the three pension fund levies meet the minimum tax component requirements under the legal statutes for the state. Okay. Thank you for, for adding that information. Does anybody else? I think we need a roll call vote, Jack. Mayor Hodges. Aye. Council President Johnson. No. Council Member Quincy. Aye. Park Board President Tapp. Aye. Vice President Becker. No. President Wheeler. Aye. Four ayes, two nays, the motion passes. Is there any other? Is there any further business? If not, I would invite somebody to make a motion to adjourn. So moved. The second. motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you very much for being here. David, never try and stop.